welcome age of vintage society. Hollywood knows how to make fake look real. We aren't talking about fantasy or science fiction pictures. We are talking about how they used talent singers to dub famous actresses without giving these singers credit. Marty Nixon was a victim of this, and this is a story about one of Hollywood's most talented invisible singers. The voice Hollywood tried to silence. Marty Nixon's story. I want you to know, my viewers, how much I appreciate you. Without your support, these videos wouldn't be possible. Thank you for those who hit the thanks button. Hollywood lied to you. They lied to all of us, and we bought that lie hook, line and sinker. OK, movies are essentially fanciful lies that take us on a journey, and truth be told, we all enjoyed those journeys of lies. Without those lies, we would never have enjoyed fantasy pictures like The Wizard of Oz. But still, it can be a little disappointing to find out that our favourite stars weren't responsible for some of the actions we watched on our screens. First it was the stunt actors who took over complex physical roles from actors, then it was the voice dubbing artists, the ghost singers, the voices without credit, and the electric singing charmers without bodies. These voice dubbing singers are like stunt actors for a star's voice, and one of the best of them has been lying under our noses all this time, Marnie Nixon. Remember Deborah Carr in The King and I, Audrey Hepburn in My Fair Lady? Natalie Wood in West Side Story, and Marilyn Monroe in Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. Those singing voices were all or mostly Marnie Nixon. She was the one who matched and unsuspectingly recreated the voice of these stars to make it seem that they were the ones singing. Sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? But it's the truth. The woman had a process to achieve this feat, but it took a lot of her skill, her concentration, and her passion for performing. The ghost singer paid attention to the accents of the actress she dubbed, and it reflected in her singing. It was hard work, and a TV show once displayed how the process could be on. To perform their experiment, they used Eliza Jackson to dub Marnie Nixon's singing. Eliza managed to copy Nixon's voice, and not only that, but her actions too. It was a process that required the singer dubbing the actress to be in complete sync with them, and it was something Nixon did repeatedly for a significant part of her singing career. For you to have a proper picture of the genius image, Deborah Carr singing in My King and I, and her movements, Marnie would have replicated everything right down to the letter. As we said, it is a lot of work, but Marnie hasn't been one to run away from a challenge. She enjoyed them. Facing those challenges made her have an enviable career and a robust singing experience which gave her complete mastery over her voice. It was why she could just lean into a song halfway and take it over from the original singer without missing a beat. It was why she could be a Broadway singer and sing in the fun singing voice that Broadway needed to keep its audience engaged. It was also why, if need be, she could go classical and belt out Mozart's aria. One of the challenges she faced was early on in her career when she was singing Mozart. Doing this was something she enjoyed because it was outside her comfort zone. Rather than the roles she was comfortable with that fit her voice, singing Mozart required her to go beyond what she was familiar with. When she executed the vocal requirements of the song, the songstress would feel proud. No wonder she did well performing Webb and songs in New York, despite the songs being notorious for their difficulty. As long as the singer had time to prepare and back to her centre, she could take on any singing task. No wonder she doesn't like the new Broadway, which she all but called a sell-out and a watered version of what it was during her time. For Marnie, Broadway was another medium for telling stories, and she feels that right now. It is just a combination of songs not geared to a particular story and assisted by flashy technology. However, the singer did admit that the audience these days doesn't have the attention span of the audience from the golden age of Hollywood. Marnie craved the period when Broadway shows had lasting effects and wasn't the shallow thing people watch these days. But it did seem like the legendary singer just had a problem with the current age. She even criticised technology. Marnie felt technology has sucked life away from having personal relationships. Then your manager was the person you had almost daily contact with. It felt personal for both the manager and the artist, but she felt these days managers and artists don't even see 
All they need to do is pick up their phones and communicate. Looks like Marnie was the queen of old school, and you can't fault her for this. Her work required her to pay maximum attention to detail. She couldn't even pick a costume for the fun of it, or because the audience would be hooked by the costume. She chose her costumes on the requirements of the show and how practical it would be. So when she sees superficial stuff, it's normal for her heart to ache. Telling stories through songs was something she did all her life. She began to sing in theatres, and this was what gave her her major livelihood at the beginning of her singing career, and what led to her eventual fame. So, a drop in the quality of the performance would surely sadden her, but that's life. We grow and tastes change. Thankfully, the actress existed in an era where she was widely appreciated. Maybe saying she was appreciated is a big statement, considering that she couldn't reveal that she was the voice behind the notable actresses she dubbed. However, we'll go over her life and leave you to decide if the singer was truly valued enough, or if she was just a pawn in Hollywood's big entertainment wheel. So, join us as we leap into the past. We begin in 1930. The talent Pitch Perfect singer was born. Marnie Nixon wasn't always the ghost with the mostest. As Liberace described her, she was once human and was born February 22, 1930, in Altadena, California. Her mother, who was passionate about music, ensured that her children would learn how to play instruments. However, Marnie stood out. Her mother discovered she had perfect pitch, and she began to take violin lessons when she was four years old. The feeling was that she would become a violinist when she grew up. However, life has other plans. The singer's parents couldn't afford to pay for Marnie and the other kids' music training. Marnie had to get creative. She, along with her sisters, began to sing to pay for their music training. They had gigs at Kiwana's clubs and PTA meetings, which gave them money they needed to stay in music school. In addition, Marnie had the makings of a star. She began to appear in films as an extra. She was in films like Babes on Broadway, Song to Remember, Grapes of Wrath, the Emperor's Wrath, and a host of other films. No wonder she attended summer lessons at the Pasadena Playhouse when she was ten. You would think she would have an ego with the amount of talent she had, and how much she was involved in different works, but her mother took care of that right from when she was young. Rather than overly praising her kids, Nixon's mum only complimented their efforts accordingly. This made Nixon and her siblings want to improve. So instead of getting validation from people, they got it from the success of pulling something off while playing their instruments. If only Natalie Wood was raised that way, maybe the scandal involving her and Nixon would have been avoided. For Nixon, the mindset, while it eliminated her ego, but it also didn't let her get recognition quicker. Her skill with the violin grew. Well, one hour of practice every day before school helped to do the trick, even if it made neighbours dislike her. You don't want to be there when a person is learning the violin. The grating sounds newbies of the instrument make can be jarring. We understand how those neighbours felt, but Marnie didn't care about this. Soon she was playing in youth orchestra and symphonies. Still, the delightful singer hadn't decided she would be a singer yet. All she thought of was just using it as a way to make money for her violin lessons. But things changed when she was 11 years old. The legendary Go singer registered for a singing competition at the L.A. County Fair, which took place in Pomona, and she smashed the competition to bits. She won the competition and got the $100 prize money. It was then she decided she wanted to sing instead, and subsequently began to audition. Her auditions yielded positive results as she got to join Roger Wagner, an esteemed choral director. The Amazing Singer became one of the founding members of the Roger Wagner Choral, or the Los Angeles Master Choral as it later became. She sang 16th century with the group and soon became a soloist. They had shows at the Hollywood Bowl and in other popular places. Singing with the choral helped improve her as a singer. It allowed her to also tap into that side of her that was an actress. Her time at the Pasadena Playhouse paid off big time. But she wasn't just delighting the audience on stage. The legendary singer had a job singing on the radio for Stravinsky and Robert Kraft. The incredible musician also sang with the New York Philharmonic, where she worked with Leonard Bernstein, singing Pierre Boulez's songs. Then she became a messenger at MGM, all the while thinking her success would be in the theatre or the opera houses she so frequented. 
Maybe it would have been a life on the stage for her. However, Bronislaw Caper, an MGM composer, discovered her by pure chance, and the studio contracted her to be the ghost singer for Margaret O'Brien, a child star in the film The Secret Garden. With that, the floodgates of ghost singing roles opened, but the one that made her studio favourite was her work for Marilyn Monroe's Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. When Fox starred Marilyn in the film, it wasn't as if Marilyn didn't have any singing talent. Her sultry low voice was a great fit, but there were high notes she needed to reach and her voice just couldn't reach them. So Marnie filled in those places that needed high notes with her pitch-perfect four-octave vocal range. Like that, Marnie became the known unknown, and she was fine with it. She didn't have a choice but to be fine, actually. She had signed a contract that prevented her from revealing she was the real voice behind those songs. To remove all evidence of her contribution, her name never appeared in the credits. The studio then called her to threaten her that they would run her out of business if she let slip that she was the real singer. The studio tied up all loose ends neatly, and afterward they gave her the ghost singing work of dubbing Deborah Carr's voice in The King and I. This was one of her best dubbing works, and it was not because of her talent, but because of how Deborah Carr was completely cooperative with Nixon. The two of them would spend long hours together practicing. Marnie absorbed everything about Carr. She copied her British accent and learned how it influenced her singing voice. She also copied Carr's mannerisms. Carr wasn't angry that Marnie would dub her. The two even entered the studio together, and what they made was magic. By mastering Carl's mannerisms, Marnie was able to produce a performance that fitted Carl perfectly. So when Carl was lip-syncing to the song, it felt real, like she was the one singing. The film was a successful one, but despite that, Marnie only made $420 and didn't get credited for all her troubles. But all things considered, Marnie was having the time of her life. It was a fun experience for her. Only things soon went wrong. Carr unknowingly created a big scandal. She revealed a closely guarded secret. Carr, being the open person that she was, revealed that she didn't have the vocal range to pull off the songs she sang in The King and I. An interviewer asked Carr who now sang the songs, and she said that the studio didn't want her to say. She said the truth. Carr revealed that it was Marnie who sang the songs, and the two of them collaborated. Carr smashed the illusion of perfection the studio worked too hard to project. No one spoke about dubbing, not the studios nor the stars, but here was Carr just revealing the secrets comfortably. Carr didn't mean to put Marnie in trouble. She only thought she was being honest and the two would work together in the future in an affair to remember. Nonetheless, when Marnie heard what Carr said, she was certain the studio would make good on its threat. But with the film's success and Carl's honesty, Nixon became a whispered name in most studios for dub work. So when Audrey Hepburn needed help with her singing for My Fair Lady, the studio brought Marnie in. Hepburn was appreciative of Marnie and the two became friends. Hepburn would pick Marnie up when they wanted to go record and the two would engage in the most personal discussions. Hepburn even invited Marnie to join her in her music lessons. Audrey wanted to try to sing every song in the musical and wanted to learn from Marnie, but she concluded that Marnie was on another level entirely. She had the grace to admit that there were notes she couldn't reach and cooperated with Nixon. It must have hurt Audrey that she couldn't truly sing, but she accepted and moved on. So the good thing was for Marnie she got to work with more notable artists but not all of them gave her the same satisfaction that working with Carl gave her. Natalie Wood gave Nixon a hard time. You see, Natalie Wood wasn't a very good singer, and she had an ego that didn't let her see how poor she was when it came to singing. So when the studio brought in Marnie, they didn't tell Wood they wouldn't use any of her material. They let Wood record the songs, but secretly brought in Marnie to do the singing. When Wood found out on the last day of production, she was livid, and it showed during the film as her lips didn't sync with the song. Wood could be quite the diva if she wanted to be. However, despite Wood giving her a hard time, it was dubbing for Wood that made Nixon decide she had had enough. Rather than taking pleasure in singing, she wanted to sing and be known as the singer. So she struck out on her own, and she got some credited roles under her belt. Her decision turned out to be the best as she was able to reach a level where she could have her own music teaching job, 
at the California Institute of Arts. She also taught at the Music Academy of the West. The singer lived a full life on her terms until she became sick. The legendary singer was diagnosed with breast cancer and she died when she was 86. Hollywood lost a legend in her. Barney Nixon with the golden voice who deserved more recognition than she received. But before you go, don't forget to click on the next video to find out how Dinah Shaw's cringy questions made millions. Trust us, it's a story you won't want to miss.